Establishment candidate Chantel Brown has defeated Nina Turner in Ohio's special election, winning 50% of the vote to Turner's 45. Turner conceded, saying the campaign knew this would be an uphill battle. She went on to say, quote, while we didn't cross the river, we inspired thousands to dream bigger and expect more. Turner also blasted dark money. Let's take a listen. former national press secretary for the Bernie Sanders presidential campaign and co-host of the Bad Faith podcast, Brianna Joy Gray joins us now to discuss. Brianna, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, what influence, you know, Nina Turner is saying that it's the, it's the dark money or it's the evil money. What influence do you think that actually had in the result of this election? It's pretty hard to deny the influence when you look at the election results. What really put uh, Chantel Brown over the edge, so far it seems, is extremely high turnout in more affluent white parts of the city. A lot of us at the campaign headquarters were shocked at the results being as close as they were, but the people who were canvassing in areas that were wider and more affluent, in fact, weren't. I didn't speak to a single person in the course of the last few days that I've been here who was black, who didn't have, wasn't at least on the fence or have an ambivalent attitude about uh, who they were going to vote for, other than people who were actively wearing Chantel Brown merchandise, some of whom who had come from out of state to actually support the candidate because of how enthusiastic they were about the Democratic Party. Usually that was what I was told, right? They support Chantel Brown because of the Democratic Party, not because of any particular policy uh, aspect of her policy platform or any specific thing that they had thought that she was going to fight for. Um, I went, woke up in the morning, I went to CVS to get some toiletries, and I talked to the woman behind the counter, and yes, uniformly it was Nina Turner, Nina Turner, Nina Turner. However, those who were um, at more affluent polling locations heard people say things like, for example, you know, if it's not, if Nita Turner wins this election, I'm going to go ahead and vote for a Republican. And in fact, Ohio does have open primaries. And so what we saw was the influence of big money, specifically DMFI, a pro-Israel group that spent $2 million here in the final stretch to send circulars um, to communities that would be galvanized by the idea that Nita Turner wasn't a pro-Israel candidate, that Nita Turner wasn't going to look out for those specific or set, a particular set of interests. And I think what you saw when you see the to turnouts from exactly those areas, putting Chantel Brown over the edge by those 3,000 votes, that's what happened. Yeah, Brianna, there's an interesting parallel to South Carolina here, that the, the national press you know, covered this, the South Carolina presidential primary as a, as, as a resounding victory for, for Jim Clyburn in galvanizing the black community to reject Bernie Sanders, but it was only uh, months later when people sifted through the turnout data, what they saw was that black turnout had been largely flat relative to previous years, but there had been this massive surge in white suburban turnout that had that had been that had gone overwhelmingly for Biden, and it was the kind of voter that is you know driven by you know M MS MSNBC and, and you know getting getting the message that there, that there had been this consolidation. But you know it's also you know I want to get your take on that, but it's it's also really important you know, in, in the wake of these defeats for, for the left to be clear-eyed about what it did wrong and what lessons it can learn in the area where it has its own agency, things that it can control. So, you know, what, what to you are the, are the lessons to take away from this? Well, some folks on the campaign were saying that uh, the early voting results were a real kick in the gut, right? The expectation was that because Chantel, Chantel's Brown influx of money and influence came a little later in the day, that the early votes folks were hoping would come through enormously overwhelmingly for Senator Turner, and that wasn't the case. Um, what seems to have happened is that Chantel Brown's campaign was able to get to, again, certain demographics that are more hostile to progressive interests, getting to, into nursing homes, getting people to fill out early ballots long before a lot of the last minute negative volley of ads went back and forth. Um, and that really also helped her get a lead that was difficult to overcome. But Ryan, your question about what progressives actually 
have power over is a really interesting one because I think these election results are going to tee up deeper questions that have been percolating about how much a candidate like Senator Turner should continue to try to run within a Democratic Party that will go so far and do so much to try to prevent them to, from being in office. This was a candidate who was up, what, 20, 30 points in the polls um, before this last volley of outside dark, dirty money. Um, and it was a race between two black candidates, both local candidates, both of whom um, would ostensibly, from the perspective of a purely identity-based group like the CBC, be a boon um, for that body. However, you saw the most powerful Democrats in America and enormous amounts of money, $6 million was spent in this race, by far the most expensive race in this cycle, all because Nita Turner advocates for some basic issues that majorities of Americans want. And if the Democratic Party is going to define itself as a party that will do anything and spend anything and leverage any interest, including right-wing money, against a candidate simply because they support a $15 minimum wage, something that was a basic aspect of the Democratic Party agenda, if they're going to be smeared as anti-Democrat for supporting Medicare for All, something that 88% of Democratic voters support, at what point are we going to continue to run? Are progressives going to continue to run candidates that openly choose to identify with that party? That's a really great question. I think a lot of people are kind of at that point where they feel like it's just time to break away, that the Democratic Party isn't moving um, fast enough or even at all really towards progressive policies. Um, and I, I'm curious how do you think that there was that there's sort of a, an idea of maybe distancing from you know wh how much of the of the smearing I would say coming from not only right the right but also from the establishment Democrats against progressives against the squad? I'm curious how much you think that might have had to play with okay there's a new member might be joining the squad, and this is not we well, don't want it to grow. I definitely spoke to one um, woman, the only, I think, white woman that I spoke to yesterday. Um, remember that Cleveland is a majority minority city and it is the largest poor city in America. I spoke to one white woman who I perceived to be more uh, upper upper middle class who said explicitly, I don't want to vote for Senator Turner because she reminds me of the squad. And I think it's inappropriate for the squad to be oppositional to the Democratic Party. I think they just need to pass the infrastructure bill and stop trying to hold it up over issues like climate. I asked her if climate was a priority for her. And she says, sure, I care about climate, but the Democrats are just going to get it done when they're going to get it done. And right now we need to do something. And the something is the infrastructure bill. And she was willing to settle for whatever it was in the abstract name of unity. So what it seems to me from my perspective is that there is a much big, bigger project that needs to be done, a bigger re-education project about what it means to be a Democrat, how exactly any legislation gets passed, how it is that the right has been able to do exactly, use the exact strategy that the left is starting to deploy now to push for more concessions from the party and able to drag it, to enable it to drag to a more rightward direction. And that if there's ever going to be any counterbalance and the Democrats actually want to deliver Deliver for their constituents instead of just being a placeholder for people to land who aren't Republican and aren't Trump voters, they're going to have to embrace a certain kind of adversarial politics. One woman I spoke to at length and who I interviewed for yesterday's Bad Faith podcast is someone who comes from the freedom fighting tradition of the black community. And she was really bristling at the idea that it was seen as uh, a negative to be opposed to the Democratic Party because when she was growing up, she says, they understood that Martin Luther King and all the rest, their job was to push the Democratic Party, to make it its best, to go to antagonize and go up against a Democratic Party in a two-party system, neither of whom had any demonstrated history or particularized interest in fighting for the interest of black people or any other marginalized group. Notably, obviously, the Poor People's Campaign was the focus of the movement right before Martin Luther King's assassination. Um, and that is a legacy, a history that I think, if more widely embraced and understood by Democratic voters, would really change the way that they framed and thought about elections like the one here in Ohio, Ohio's 11th district. And so because of the, the low turnout in, in the election, the, the four to five point loss or five to six point loss uh, that, that Nina Turner suffered was actually only about a 4,300 vote difference. You know, Rashi Rashida Tlaib, uh, people might forget, actually ran in a special election and, and lost it. 
uh, by about 1,000 votes, and then won, uh, won the, the general election. The, weirdly, they were held on the, on the same day. Uh, Cori Bush obviously lost badly, I think, by 20 points or so in 2018, and then mm -hmm. came back and, and won. What was the mood uh, at, at, at the Turner uh, headquarters last night about a, a run in the in the in the next general election, you know, you know, for the, for the next, because this was just a special election, and were were there people saying, you know what, run run independent, you'll have a better shot that way, or are there people saying, no, you can you can win a, a higher turnout Democratic uh, primary when when more people are are coming out next year. Well, I did immediately hear people start to talk about the fact that this was just a special election and that there would be another bite at the apple coming up very shortly. And Senator Turner's speech, if you listen to it in whole, was actually really strongly pointing in that direction and took a room that very quickly could have slipped into a very dark, depressing place and buoyed it right back up and converted, I think, a lot of the sadness and frustration into a kind of righteous anger. Um, this was not a carpet bagging sort of race. The people who were committed to Senator Turner's run were local, largely people who were local. Senator Turner is a local candidate and that's part of why she was able to get so much support from including moderates in the district. I spoke to one city councilman at um, the Warrensville polling stop not too far from my grandmother's house yesterday about how he was a Chantel Brown delegate and flipped to Senator Nita Turner because of he saw the energy in the community and that she was the one that was going to meet the needs of the community that he served, right? And so people on the ground realizing that this was kind of a victory snatched uh, from the jaws of, or uh, a defeat snapped from the uh, snatched from the jaws of victory, I think feel very galvanized and very frustrated. And it's really been an eye opening experience about the extent to which the Democratic Party really is against the interest of black people, working class people and a lot of America. And optimistically, I think there is the real possibility that, as Senator Turner said, this is just the start of a story and a rebuilding of a narrative that says that our job as progressives, our job as working class people, is to hold the Democratic Party accountable. And I wonder if we'll continue to see races where people brand themselves as I'm the big D Democrat without anything else to their name and expect voters to believe that that's going to mean that they're going to ever do anything or deliver. Yeah, and it certainly was remarkable to see the, the result of several million dollars worth of energy from the Democratic establishment to, to uh, prevent Nina Turner from winning on the very same day that Biden capitulated to pressure from Cori Bush, you know, who right. the Democratic establishment, you know, spent a significant amount of time and energy trying to prevent uh, from getting into Congress. And you, you almost uh, could, could see why they, they, they were quite comfortable allowing uh, that eviction moratorium to lapse and and they had presumed that there wouldn't be much attention on it and if not for uh, you know those you know those 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 kids and that mangy dog you know, that that, uh, that that forced the country to pay attention to it you know they would have gotten away with it and so you could you could almost you could almost see you know uh, why they're spending so much effort to keep somebody like Turner out yeah and look I, I spoke to one young voter um, who wasn't involved in the Senator Turner campaign and who was l largely naive about what was going on. And when I explained the election results to her, she said, oh, but isn't Chantel Brown a Democrat? Perfectly well-meaning, but really that is the starting point for so many voters, right? The n kind of the lack of understanding that the Democratic Party isn't a brand that they should feel protected by. It's not a warm blanket that you can trust that's going to do its best to keep you safe. And this may or may not have been a miscalculation <laughs> by these corporate Democrats to come into a community with a really significant kind of activist tradition, a minority majority community that's really suffering economically, leveraging the votes of the most affluent members of the community on an identity-based issue that involves U.S. interventionism and some of the worst overreaches of our imperial state and use it to undermine a grassroots working class woman candidate black woman candidate who has already been very publicly maligned by the mainstream media and actors that continue to be awarded for having done so if people write this story properly and if organizers on the ground take this lesson to the people and frame it appropriately, this is a state that could be 
the ground zero for a real cognitive shift in how we see politics. And remember, Ohio is a state that has historically has been blue and has been purple for a while. And if the if the Democratic Party thought differently about things, if they thought about the long term potential of getting activist energy in the state that could actually help it to win, um, uh, you know, congressional seats back in the long term to flip the state in a, in a presidential election, then they might have understood that Senator Turner was someone who might cause them a little bit of problems on the edges, but could really help make mm -hmm. people believe that the Democratic Party does enough for them to actually warrant voting for them in general elections. And now we're going to find out what the consequences are going to be, because as the saying goes, you know, they effed around. <laughs> yeah, well, they'll find out. Brianna Joy Gray, co-host of the Bad Faith Podcast, uh, thank you for joining us from Ohio. Always a pleasure. And we'll have more Rising for you right after this.